Today on this uh, last day of Unleavened Bread, it's great to be here on the special feast day and be here with all of you on a very festive occasion. I want to today relate a rather bizarre incident which occurred in the days just leading up to the Passover back in the year in which Christ died. Because on the surface, this particular incident that occurred makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. But in reality, it has tremendous meaning in regards to the Passover, in regards to the Days of Unleavened Bread, in regards to the countdown to Pentecost we're entering into now, and in regards to Pentecost itself and to our marriage to Christ. But this bizarre incident defies logic. It's recorded in two of the Gospels. It's recorded in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. We'll be looking at both of those accounts. But let's begin our introduction to this particular incident in Matthew's account to get the time frame. You turn to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, and we'll begin in verse 17, where it says, Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside on the road, and he said to them, verse 18, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed. Be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. And the third day he will rise again. So Christ here plainly tells his 12 disciples precisely what's going to happen in the days ahead. None of them get it. They didn't get it at all. It went right over their heads. They just didn't believe this at all. They didn't really get it. They didn't get what he said but it does give us a time frame that's going to lead up to this incident that we're going to look at. It's now the week leading up to the events that Christ describes here in verses 18 and 19. In fact, everything recorded in the remainder of chapter, these chapters of Matthew from here on out occurred in the days leading up to his death and resurrection, including this bizarre incident we will soon read of. Let's go to Matthew 21, verse 1. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. Now I covered this in detail about a year or so ago in a sermon previous sermon, but Christ rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, showing that he was a king of peace, because the donkey, as I read in that sermon, is the right of coming, coming in peace, showed he was going to come as a prince of peace or king of peace, not a king of war, which would have been the case if he had been riding into Jerusalem on a horse, because a horse was the right of war, the mount of war, if you will. He also wrote on a donkey to fulfill the prophecy of Zechariah 9, verse 9, as we are told here in verse 4 of Matthew 21. Let's turn there. Let's go back to Zechariah 9, verse 9 here. I just want to point something out here, especially in verse 10. But Zechariah 9, now let's read this because it tells us why he rode in on a donkey rather than a horse. Zechariah 9, verse 9, this is a prophecy that he fulfilled. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Again, why a donkey instead of a horse? Verse 10. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. Why? Because the next line this verse tells us the battle bow shall be cut off. The horse was used in battle. It was the mount for making war. But what will Christ do instead? The very last line of this verse, he shall speak peace to the nations. He rode into Jerusalem on a donkey because he came the first time to speak peace to the nations. He came as a prince of peace and to suffer and die for us so we might have peace with one another. Thus he rode in Jerusalem on a donkey on the Mount of Peace, the Mount that portrayed that. What will Christ be riding on when he returns? He'll be riding on a white horse, Revelation 19.11. Why a horse? 
Because in righteousness he judges and makes war. Same verse, Revelation 19, verse 11. And the horse is the mount of war. But in Matthew 21, he rides in Jerusalem on a donkey on the Mount of Peace because he was coming as a peacemaker at that particular time and to die so the world could eventually have peace through his sacrifice. Let's go back to Matthew 21. To lead up to this incident I'm talking to talk about today. Matthew 21, verse 6. So the disciples went out and did as Jesus commanded them, and they brought the donkey and the colt laid their clothes on them and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna, the son of David, Hosanna. And that really means save us, save us. Blessed are you who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Verse 10, and when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? What's this all about? Then Christ drove the money changers out of the temple, as it tells us in verse 12. It's going out of verse 17 in Matthew 21. Then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, and he lodged there for that night. Then comes this very bizarre incident. Verse 18. Now in the morning... As he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. And he said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. And immediately the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, well, how did this fig tree wither away so soon? Now, why is this particular incident related to us here? Why is that so bizarre? Why does it defy logic? Mark's account provides the answer. Let's go to Mark chapter 11. It gives us the same account. Mark 11. And we'll begin reading in verse 12 of Mark 11. Now, the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. Just like I said there in Matthew, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. It wasn't time for figs yet to be ripe. It was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Now, did you notice that? When he came to it, when he came to this fig tree, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Matthew's account tells us, as we returned to the city, he was hungry, and seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing but leaves and said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. And yet Christ had to know, as Mark tells us, it was not the season for figs. So here's the question. Why then did Christ curse this fig tree for not having any figs when he had to know it was not the season for figs? He had to know it wouldn't have any figs on it because it was too early for it to have yet produced any figs. Which now leads to my title for today's sermon, Why Did Christ Curse the Fig Tree? See, this is a very bizarre incident that on the surface defies logic. Why would Christ curse a fig tree for not producing figs when he knew it couldn't yet produce figs. And what does this bizarre incident have to do with Passover, the days of unleavened bread, the countdown to Pentecost, and Pentecost itself? That's what we're going to look at today. Why did Christ curse the fig tree? And what lessons can we learn from this particular incident? Now notice this also. 
This is not a parable. This is a real incident that happened to teach us a special lesson. But it's not a fabricated story like a parable to teach us a lesson. This is a real incident that Christ uses here. It's an actual incident, but does teach an extremely valuable spiritual lesson. I want to begin here by quoting from William Barclay's New Testament Study Bible. He writes a one, he, he, I think he died a while back, but he wrote a wonderful study Bible of the New Testament. But sit down with what he says here. This is William Barclay's New Testament Study Bible, The Way of the Fig Tree, and his comments on Matthew 21, verses 18 to 22. The strangest thing about this story is twofold. First, it tells us of a fig tree in full leaf in April. Jesus was at Jerusalem for the Passover. The Passover fell in April, and this incident happened a week before. The second thing is that Jesus looked for figs on a tree where no figs could possibly be. For Mark says it was not the season for figs. The difficulty of this story, Barclay goes on, is a moral difficulty. We see Jesus blasting a fig tree for not doing what it was not able to do. The tree could not have borne fruit in the second week of April, and yet we see Jesus destroying it for not doing that very thing. The plain truth is this. If we had read of anyone else blasting a fig tree for not bearing figs in April, we would have said it was an act of ill-tempered petulance, springing from personal disappointment. In Jesus, that is inconceivable. Therefore, there must be some other explanation. What is it? And actually, you know, William Barclay he makes some comments, but he doesn't know. He doesn't really give a good explanation. He really doesn't have a good explanation for it in his commentary. So indeed, what is the explanation? Why did Christ curse the fig tree? Like I said, even William Barclay doesn't really come up with a very clear explanation. In fact, he even states this in his commentary on that. He says, few honest readers of the Bible would deny that this is perhaps the most uncomfortably difficult passage in the New Testament. And it's so uncomfortably difficult, even for William Barclay, he can't come up with an answer himself. So then, what is the explanation? Why did Christ curse this fig tree? And what lesson does this incident teach us in relation to the Passover in the days of unleavened bread and Pentecost? I want to begin with one of Christ's Beatitudes. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, I'm just going to read one of the Beatitudes here, in Matthew 5, verse 9, because it ties into this story. We're going to have to look at different pieces of the puzzle and try to fit them together to solve this mystery. Matthew 5, verse 9, said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now, what does this particular Beatitude have to do with the cursing of this fig tree? Well, I believe it has everything to do with it. I think it's one of the keys to understanding it. Remember, Christ rode into Jerusalem on a donkey on the mount of a peacemaker. He was coming as a peacemaker to speak peace to the nations, as we read in Zechariah 9, verse 10. A very familiar millennial scripture portrays the peace of Christ and the peace that he's going to establish on the earth after he returns. After he first makes war and destroys all the enemies of peace, but this familiar scripture then begins to lead us to an explanation as to why Christ cursed the fig tree. Let's go to the book of Micah. Let's go back to Micah chapter 4. Again, a very familiar scripture. Minor Prophets, Micah chapter 4, and I'll begin in verse 1. Oftentimes we read these at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, but it pertains to this particular incident. Micah 4, verse 1, It shall come to pass the latter days 
that the mountain of the Lord's house should be established on the top of the mountains and should be exalted above the hills, be established over all the other larger nations and the smaller nations as well. It's going to rule over the entire earth, over all nations. And people shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth in the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Instead of learning the way of war, they are instead going to learn the way of peace. The world cannot now find. They will learn how to make peace in all of their relationships. They will learn how to become peacemakers. And they will learn how to produce the fruit of peace. What tree and what fruit is used to depict that? What tree and what fruit is used here to depict to depict, I should say, peace and the way to peace. What tree is used to depict producing the fruit of peace? Micah 4, verse 4. Everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree. And no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. The fig tree is used here to portray and to symbolize peace. It is used to symbolize producing the fruit of peace. Now let me ask this. Another piece of the puzzle that's interesting to look at. Where is the fig tree first mentioned in the Bible? And where was that fig tree located? Let's go back to Genesis 3. Read it for ourselves. You all know what Genesis 3 is about. Genesis chapter 3, we'll begin in verse 1. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field with the Lord God, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, As God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, Well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. But then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed leaves together and made themselves coverings. I'm trying to see the, what, what, what. Oh, I mean, there it is, verse 7. I could, my eyes don't pick up on it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. They, they sewed fig leaves together. So the fig tree is mentioned here as being one of the fruit trees of the Garden of Eden. What did Adam and Eve do next? Verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees in the garden. And presumably, some of the trees that they hid themselves among were fig trees. Because fig trees were used here by Adam and Eve to cover their nakedness. And fig trees were also likely used to try to hide themselves from God because they have very large leaves. And they'd be easy to hide amongst fig trees. And by so doing, mankind was on his way toward losing the peace they had in their relationship with God and they had in their relationship with one another. 
Well, once Christ returns, the fig tree will become the symbol of peace once again. Everyone will sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one will make them afraid. Micah 4, verse 4. See, what does the entire world need more than anything else? It needs peace. It needs to find and know and learn the way to peace and how to produce the fruit of peace in all of their relationships. As symbolized by the fig tree and by the fruit of the fig tree. But why then did Christ curse the fig tree and cause it to wither away and die so it would never again produce any figs? First, let's look at some facts about fig trees. Remember this particular incident took place in April, before the Passover and Days of Unleavened Bread. And as we're told in Mark, it was not yet the season for figs. And even though it was not yet the season for figs to be produced, could fig trees by this time in early April in Palestine have leaves and put forth green figs? Was that possible in Judea by early April? Now, if you go to commentaries, some will say no. But I found one website where they showed a picture of a fig tree with full leaves and with green figs on it, green unripened figs, taken near the Mount of Olives around the middle of April. So it is possible. In fact, a scripture in the Song of Solomon actually confirms that. Let's go there. Let's go to the Song of Solomon, chapter 2. Right after Ecclesiastes, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, chapter 2. Just look at a couple of verses here. Verse 10. Song of Solomon 2, verse 10. My beloved spoke and said to me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. Obviously speaking of the coming of spring, which can begin in Palestine in late March or early April. Now notice the next verse, verse 13. The fig tree puts forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grapes give a good smell. Obviously, neither the figs nor the grapes were anywhere near ready to harvest yet. But the green figs and the tender grapes had begun to appear in April, according to the Song of Solomon here. By the beginning of the spring season in Palestine, according to this particular verse. Now, the Bible Almanac by Packer, Tenney, and White has this to say about fig trees. Very interesting. I want to read this. This is from the Bible Almanac on Plants and Herbs, page 254, under figs. The fig tree was cultivated in Palestine and other Mediterranean countries, Deuteronomy 8, verse 8. Although it is not tall, its large leaves and widely spreading branches provide excellent shade. Sitting under a fig tree was typical of peace and prosperity. 1 Kings 4.25, Micah 4, verse 4, Zechariah 3, verse 10. The Hebrew word for the fig tree was tina, T-E-E-N-A-H, meaning to spread out because its leaves spread out and give a lot of shade. There were two crops of figs in ancient Palestine. Very interesting fact. Two crops of figs in ancient Palestine. The early harvest appeared in June and was called the Bikori, B-I-K-K-O-R-E, Hosea 9, verse 10. The later crop ripened continually from August on and was called the Kermuz, K-E-R-M-O-U-S-E. Now, another, another comment here. The Bible Almanac, Plants and Herbs, page 267, under Dates and Figs. Cultivated from very early times, Figs grew on low trees with thick spreading branches. The pear-shaped fruit of the green fig appeared before the leaves. Let me read that again. The pear-shaped fruit 
of the green fig appeared before the leaves. When the leaves attained some size, their interior is filled with small white flowers. Now notice what it says here. If the leaves came out and no fruit appeared among them, the tree would remain barren for that season. Faith could be gathered as early as June, but the main crop ripened about August. So, some very interesting facts there about figs. And understanding these facts can help us to deduce lessons Christ may have wanted us to make here and teach us from this cursing of this fig tree. Fact number one is given here in the Bible Almanac. The fig tree produced two crops. An early crop, which ripened and was ready to harvest in June around the time of Pentecost to get a spiritual connection here. This was the first fruits harvest of figs in Palestine. Then there was the main second harvest, which began as early as August and continued on through the fall, through the time of the fall feasts. Fact number two, the green fig, the yet unripened fig, appeared before the leaves came out on the fig tree. But as Mark's account tells us, it was not yet the season for figs. That is, they would not yet be ready to harvest that early. They might appear, but they wouldn't be ready to harvest. That time or season wouldn't come until June, until around Pentecost. But since the green figs appeared before the leaves, a fig tree with leaves in April should have some green figs on it because the green figs appeared first before the leaves, normally. Now, they wouldn't have been very tasty at that particular point, but they still could have been eaten if you were really hungry. And Christ was hungry, it said. It tells us he was, he was very hungry. Matthew 21, 18, and Mark 11, verse 12, says he was hungry. So with these facts in mind, let's read Mark's account again. Let's go back again to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, let's begin in verse 12. Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. Speaking of Christ, Christ was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. Since green figs appear before the leaves, a fig tree with leaves should have green figs on it, as an indicator that a first fruits crop is being produced. Did this particular fig tree have any figs? And seeing a fig tree from afar off having leaves, he went to see if perhaps it should have something on it. Because it, if it had leaves, it should have figs, because the figs appear before the leaves. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for figs. It had leaves. And since green figs appear before the leaves, it should have also had green figs. But it says here it had nothing but leaves. It didn't have any figs. Now it's true it was not the season for figs. Not yet time for the early figs to be ripe or to be ready to harvest. But this tree should have had at least some green unripened figs on it. This was near Bethphage. Bethphage, it should be, is going back to Mark 11 and 1, when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethphage. And Bethphage means house of unripened figs. This is an area we ought to have a lot of unripened figs in the spring when the leaf comes on the fig trees. Yet there were no green or unripened figs on this particular fig tree, even though it had leaves. Meaning what? Meaning there was no hope of this tree producing a first fruits harvest of figs. Now, what did I just get through reading from the Bible Almanac? I read, if the leaves came out 
and no food appeared among them, the tree would remain barren for the season. This tree was doomed. It would bear no fruit for the early June harvest. It bear no fruit for the Pentecost harvest, if you will. And Christ immediately knew that. Verse 14 of Mark 11, in response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. The opportunity for this particular tree to bear fruit was gone. It had missed out on its opportunity to be a part of the early fruits, fruits harvest of figs. Which then poses this question. What could cause a fig tree to produce leaves but no figs? What could cause that to happen? Well, there are at least three possibilities. Number one, could become diseased. That apparently was not the case with this particular tree, however. Why not? Because every indication here is that it outwardly looked like a healthy tree with green leaves. Number two, a second possibility. It could have been past the age of producing figs. And this reverted back to being kind of in its wild state. Fig trees normally produce figs for up to about 15 years or more, a little more than 15 years maybe. But they live much longer than that. So it could, could be a, this tree might be old enough for us to really not producing figs every, figs every season because it's just too old. It could maybe simply stop producing fruit. But in this case, it appears it should have still been producing fruit. Number three, third reason. It could have had a soil problem. It could have had a problem within its root system. It could have been drying up from its roots. And that indeed was the problem with this particular fig tree. And that is the reason it had no figs. Mark 11, verse 20. In the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from its roots. Now, one might say, well, it dried up from its roots because Christ cursed it. Certainly, that's a possibility. But I think Christ cursed it because he knew it was drying up from its roots. So he could then teach us a very valuable lesson from that. Because once the tree has dried up from its roots, it will no longer be able to produce any fruit. So why did Christ curse the fig tree? I think because he understood and knew the real problem with this particular tree. He understood why it wasn't producing any green figs, why it wasn't producing any fruit. Its root system had dried out. It was already dying from within, from lack of water. Thus, it would never be able to be a part of the harvest of the first fruits of figs, though it had the opportunity. And though it may still have looked like a good tree because of its green leaves. You know, it takes a long time for a tree to die. But Christ cursing this fig tree may have merely sped up the process to teach us a very valuable lesson. But this tree was already cursed. Christ merely sped up the process and simply stated the inevitable. It would never produce fruit for the early harvest because it had dried up from its roots. Mark 11, verse 14, he said, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. Let no one eat, eat first fruits from you ever again, we might say. You know, this tree was doomed when it came to producing a first fruits crop because it had dried up from its roots. So what then is the main lesson that we can all learn from this? What does Christ want all of us to learn from this particular incident? Let's go to the book of John, John 15. I think this is the lesson that ties in. John chapter 15. Verse 1, 
Very familiar scriptures, we read at Passover. Christ said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Verse 4, abide in me, Christ said, and let me abide in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Because I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, if you don't abide in me, you can do nothing. You're just going to dry up and wither away. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, just like this fruit tree withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. It's going to take a lot more trials in order to get this branch to bear fruit. So as first truth with Christ, what kind of fruit must we produce if we are to abide in Christ and if Christ is to abide in us? Well, we're given those specifically by the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 5. But I want to look at one particular fruit that's listed there. Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23, that we're all familiar with. Galatians 5, verse 22, tells us the fruit that should be produced by God's Holy Spirit. And water can symbolize God's Holy Spirit as well as oil. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and one of the fruits of the Spirit is peace. Knowing how to be a peacemaker. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. So one of the fruits we must produce is the fruit of peace. We must never produce a strife, contention, division, or war. Christ rode into Jerusalem on a donkey as a bearer of peace, as the, as the prince of peace or the king of peace. Those who are going to be his first fruits must also produce peace. We must never stir up strife or division. If we do, then we, like the fig tree, will also begin to dry up from within, from our roots, if you will. And we could then become doomed to miss out on the Opportunity to be a part of that harvest of the first fruits. But this story is not only a very fascinating story to look into and think about and analyze, it's also an extremely promising and hopeful story. It has a fantastic conclusion. Have you ever known anybody that's dried up from his roots and they're kind of withering away and dying? Like this fig tree? What about this fig tree? You missed out on the spring harvest, but what about the fall harvest? If you bear two crops, is it possible could bear a crop the second time around? Is there hope for this fig tree? See, the fig tree is unique in that it produces two crops, a spring crop and a fall crop. And those who fail to produce the right fruit for the first fruits harvest may still have an opportunity to be part of that fall harvest. You know, the fig tree is a pretty hardy tree. Maybe with the proper care and with the proper amount of water, its root system could be restored. As we conclude, let's note that even Christ himself held out that particular hope in the case of this particular cursed fig tree. Let's go again to Mark chapter 11. A tremendous conclusion to this incident. Mark 11, verse 20. Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from its roots. So Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. What is Christ's response to Peter's statement? Verse 22. So Jesus answered and said to, to them, to Peter and the other disciples, he said, 
Have faith in God. Wow. He didn't say, that's it, it's all over. He said, have faith in God. Because as Christ also said, as recorded here in Mark 10, verse 27, this previous chapter, with God all things are possible. Mark 10, verse 27. Have faith in God, Peter. Because with God all things are possible, even for this dried up fig tree. Jesus answered and said, verse 22, have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you will receive them and you will have them. And never, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you of your trespasses. Forgive him. Make peace. So both you and those you forgive can have peace of mind and get past whatever the problem was and have peace in your relationships again. Because we have been called to rule with the King of Peace. We've been called to Teach the world the way of peace. To teach the entire world how to become peacemakers. So why then did Christ curse the fig tree? Well, because it was already cursed. Because it had dried up from its roots. And it could not produce any fruit. Even its green leaves would have eventually dried up and died. Where no one could sit under its shade anymore. Torah would no longer be a symbol of peace and prosperity where everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree. So this incident of Christ cursing the fig tree ties into Passover, the Days of Unleavened Bread, to the countdown to Pentecost and to Pentecost itself. Because if we ever dry up from our roots, spiritually speaking, and if we no longer produce the fruit of God's Holy Spirit, especially if we no longer produce the fruit of peace, in our relationship with one another or others, then we too will wither away, even if our leaves may still appear to be green. So this incident teaches us the all-important lesson that anyone who cannot produce the fruit of peace cannot be a part of that first fruit's harvest. And that then is why Christ cursed the fig tree. 